our goal is to be like an AGI company and a product first company. And the way to do that is by picking the right product that forces us to work on the right things. So, Noam, earlier today, Dave Bazzucchi at Roblox said that in the future, it would be very difficult to parse between a real person and their AI version. So to kick off this session, we thought it would be fun to interview you and the character AI version of yourself <laughs> to see how you both answer the same question. And note, everyone, this is live. We don't know what he will be answering. AI gnome, that is. All right. I don't, don't know what I'm going to be answering, <laughs> either, so, frankly. True. All right, are you ready? Sounds good. OK, so Noam, I, uh, I'm going to start with a softball personal question. I know that you went to Duke for undergrad. So um, can you tell us a little bit about why you decided to go to Duke? Uh, oh, oh yeah, they, uh, I went on a basketball, no, I'm joking. Uh, they, they, <laughs> <laughs> they recruited me because they wanted to win the Putnam math competition. So I uh, ended up going on, on scholarship. Great, okay, well, let's get a little more career related. Um, you were at Google for almost 20 years. Why did you decide to leave? Well, I've always been excited about AI. I've just wanted to move, push technology forward. I saw this large language model thing. Well, at the time it wasn't large language models, but <laughs> uh, you know, neural networks and like language modeling was just like the most promising uh, thing on earth. It's like best problem ever. All you have to do is predict the next word. And yet once you do it, you get something that can can just talk to you about anything. So um, I knew that, you know, you can make this technology better in a lot of ways. It's going to be amazing. We can improve it with uh, model architecture and distributed algorithms and quantization, like, and all of these things. So I was working on that, but then it struck me, hey, the biggest thing is just scale. Can you throw like a billion dollars or a trillion dollars at this thing instead of a million dollars? And what you need for that is just show a massively valuable application. And, you know, there are a few options like coding looks uh, super useful, but just also dialogue. Like it's world's number one pastime, you know, like this was like back in like 2019, 2020. And like my co-founder, uh, Daniel DeFreitas, he's been on like this lifelong mission to do chatbots and dialogue systems. So he had built the system he called Mina. It was like his 20% project and it was like really good. It was like, okay, gotta help Daniel. Let's build something amazing. We got it on giant models. It was like this internal viral sensation. And then, you know, at Google, and then they like forcibly renamed it to Lambda over some sort of uh, whatever social justice <laughs> thing. But like, anyway, like at some point realized, hey, like, you know, there's just too much brand risk in large companies to ever launch anything fun. Like, let's do a startup and let's like maximally accelerate. Um, so. Um, Interesting. Yeah. Anyway. Um, what, oh, shoot. What did... I, I, would, I would guess that that answer is also probably true. Okay. <laughs> uh, by the way, it's interesting to hear you're the third person, in addition to Mira at OpenAI and Dario at Anthropic, who's also said you haven't seen any limit to the scaling laws. So that's, that's pretty interesting. Um, we'll, we'll get more into that later. But we're going to actually look toward the future now. This is our last question for AI Noam as well. Noam, are you afraid of AGI destroying the world? Well, I, I think we just need a sort of global pause of like six months. No, about four months until we get enough <laughs> H100s online to train our next model. <laughs> I'll take that as a no. No, uh, <laughs> not yet. Not, not yet. I think the, the, there's a lot of uh, a lot of possibility uh, of uh, you know a lot, lot of potential benefits, and uh, yeah, we're 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 going to work on it as the technology improves.
Noam, I, I don't know if you got to read all of AI Noam's uh, answers, but how, how did AI Noam do? Like, how would you score his answers? Oh, that's pretty good. Yeah, that's, <laughs> that's like better than I, uh, yeah, that was, that's better than I would do. Just curious in terms of, you know, we talk about getting better, how, you know, what does better mean, right? And in some cases, it's correctness. Mm -hmm. But for character, it's not always about correctness. So how do you see AI Gnome getting better? Like, what does better mean for yeah, you? Yeah, better, I mean, you know, some of the big, th big unlocks we're working on are, yeah, just train a bigger, smarter model. The scaling laws are gonna take us pretty long way. I mean, the, the model we're serving now, we, you know, cost us about like $2 million worth of compute cycles to train last year and could probably repeat it for like half a million now. So like we're going to wow. launch something tens of IQ points smarter, uh, <laughs> ho hopefully by the, uh, by the end of the year. Um, so like, yeah, smarter. I mean, also, um, you know, just more, uh, you know, more accessible, meaning like multimodal. Maybe you want to hear a voice and see a face. And then, you know, then also just able to interact with uh, multiple people. Like, yeah, yeah. You, would you want a virtual person like in there with, you know, say with, with all your friends or do you want the experience? It's like you got elected president, you get the earpiece and you get like the whole cabinet of friends or advisors. <laughs> or it's like, you know, like you walk into Cheers and everyone knows your name and they're glad you came. Yeah. So, uh, so there's a lot we can do to make things more usable. Right now, the thing we're serving is um, like just using a context window of a few thousand tokens, which means like your lifelong friend remembers what happened for the last half hour. Which, <laughs> <laughs> and still there are a lot of people who like re are using it like hours a day. So um, so like, uh, you know, that, that will make things way better, especially if you can just dump in massive amounts of information. It should be able to know a billion things about you, like the uh, HBM bandwidth is there. Just need to do it. Yeah. Um, well, and, and actually just on that note of people on character for multiple hours a day. Um, let's talk a little bit more about character AI explicitly. So I think you've shared some of these stats publicly, um, but I'll recap a few of them. Since launch, you've seen more than 20 billion human messages sent on the platform. And even though you now have millions of DAUs, daily active users, they're still on average spending two hours daily in the platform. Is that right? You know, I, I think the way to understand this is like, you know, entertainment is like this two trillion dollar a year industry. And like the dirty secret is that entertainment is imaginary friends that don't know you exist. Like really that like the reason people interact with TV or any of these other things, it's called like this, these parasocial relationships, like your relationship with like TV characters or like book characters or like celebrities that, and like everybody does it. There are billions of lonely people out here so like it, it it's actually uh you know it's actually a very very cool problem and you know a cool first use case for um you know for agi like essentially um you know there, there's the there was the option to like go into like lots of different sorts of applications and a lot of them have a lot of like overhead and requirements like you want to launch something that's a doctor it's going to be a lot slower because you want to be really 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 careful about not providing like false information but friend you can do like really fast like it's just, it's just entertainment it makes things up that's a feature like uh, and <laughs> uh, you know so so essentially it's like this massive un unmet need and one thing that's very important is that the thing kind of feel human and be able to talk about anything and like the that matches up very well with the generality of large language models and you know one thing that's not a problem is making stuff up so like <laughs> hey, hey perfect like and if yeah. i like i want to push this technology ahead fast like that's what i want to go with because like a it's you know you know the, it's ready for an explosion, like right now, not like not like in five years when we solve all the problems, but like now. Yeah, absolutely. You know, it's a big contrast with, you know, I think a couple speakers brought up the example of self-driving cars, right? That's just a different standard that you hold to, you know, versus your your AI friend. Your AI friend or like something you view as like an AI character, AI entertainment, like yeah. what standard do you hold like a comic book you're reading? You know, like yeah, not, exactly. you know, it's, uh, you know, people like that human experience of like very mixed use cases, talk about everything. So like, it's not that we want a 
we want to fine tune to some particular domain or some particular use case. Like people want this experience of everything, which, you know, which is fine. It's what the technology is perfect for. You know, I think from the A16Z vantage point, we have seen startups come up and say, hey, I'm going to tackle the mental health use case or I'm going to tackle um, the educate the ed tech use case. So mm -hmm. go very you know, much more narrow than characters going and go after a specific use case and say, hey, you know, I think the argument is we're going to train this model to be focused on that. It's going to be better than a generalized model. Um, you know, I think you, you got into this a little bit with the mixed use cases, but um, can you share a little bit more about why you decided not to take that approach and, and why you think um, having a single model serve across a number of use cases is the best approach? Yeah, I mean, the, the more you get to like mission critical, you know, particular use case, the more you get tempted into like writing particular rules and like doing things that will not generalize well. So it was kind of important to stay away from that. So we are, you know, our goal is to be like an AGI company and a product first company. And the way to do that is by picking the right product that forces us to work on the right things, things that generalize, make the model smarter, make it like do what people, you know, what people want and serve it at massive scale and serve it cheaply. So like, I think this was like the right product for the right goal. You've also chosen this approach of building, you know, we call it a vertically integrated model and app company. Um, and there are advancements on the open source model side. And, yeah. um, you know, maybe folks building a product on top of a fine-tuned Llama 2, you know, fine-tuned for chat. Mm -hmm. um, how do you think about that kind of competition entering the market and the differences versus the approach you've taken? I mean, I love being a full stack company. It means, you know, we get to mess with every layer and like do the co-design. And like, if there's something that's going to affect something at the end, like we get to mess with it at the beginning and like we get to pull back in like lots of like user, uh, you know, user data as, as feedback. Plus like, yeah, I mean, like a lot of us invented this stuff. Like we're, of course we're going to like, yeah. uh, you know, do, do, do a full stack company. And like a lot of us are motivated by launching. So like, I think that people we're attracting to work at Character are like people who you know, who love inventing stuff and love launching it. You know, some people are motivated by publishing, you know, like I was frustrated I couldn't launch at Google. So that, you know, that, that, that's, uh, uh, that, that's where I'm coming from. I think, you know, sort of on this note, but maybe going into just the evolution of um, the underlying technology, I think there's yeah. been a, a recent finding around AI developing theory of mind um, mm -hmm. and, or, you know, just the knowledge that, yeah others' beliefs, desires, intentions um, may be different from one's own. Mm -hmm. Is this surprising to you? And, and what do you think that means for human AI relationships? Yeah, just make the thing smarter. It's going to have a better theory of mind. And uh, I think that's definitely something massively, massively important. It seems like one of these emergent properties that just is gonna, going to come with scale. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I, I see this stuff like massively scaling up. It's just not, it's just not that expensive. Like if, I mean, if you just look at it, um, I, I think I saw an article yesterday, like NVIDIA is going to build like another one and a half million H100s like next year. So like, so like that's 2 million H100s. So that's, uh, you know, two times 10 to the sixth times, like they can do about 10 to the 15th operations per second. So two times 10 to the 21 divided by like eight times 10 to the nine people on earth. So that's roughly a quarter of a trillion operations per second per person, uh, which means that, yeah, like, okay, it could be talking, you know, could be processing on the order of like one word per second on like a hundred billion parameter model for everyone on earth. But like, really, it's not gonna be everyone on earth because like some people are blocked in China and some people are sleeping and like, <laughs> but you know, uh, Things, it's not that expensive, you know, like th this thing is like massively scalable if you do it right. And, you know, we're, we're, we're working on that. Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, I think uh, you said this once that the internet was the dawn of universally accessible information and we're now entering the dawn of universally accessible intelligence. Um, you know, what did you, maybe building off of what your, your last answer, what did you mean by that? Do you think we're there yet? Yeah, I mean, I think it's like, we're really a, like a uh, Wright Brothers first airplane kind of moment, right? Like we've got something that, that works and is u useful for now some large number of use cases and 
looks like it's scaling very, very well. And without any breakthroughs, like it's going to get like massively better as everyone just kind of scales up to use it. And there will be more breakthroughs because now, you know, uh, like uh, all, all the scientists in the world are like working on like making this stuff better. It's great that like all this stuff is accessible as open source. Like, you know, we're going to see uh, like a huge amount of innovation and, you know, what what's possible in the largest companies now can be possible in, you know, in somebody's uh, academic lab or garage in a few years. And yet, you know, and then, yeah, as the technology gets better, there are just going to be all kinds of, of great use cases that emerge and pushing technology forward, pushing science, pushing the ability to, you know, help people in various ways. I love to get to the point where you can just ask it how to cure cancer or something, you know, yeah. <laughs> you know like, I mean, it's, it, it, you know, it seems a few years away for now, but you know, like. <laughs> <laughs> Do you think we need another fundamental breakthrough like the transformer technology to get there, or do you think we actually have everything that we need? I don't know. I, I mean, it's it's impossible to predict the future, but like, I don't think anyone's seen like these scaling laws, you know, stop. I think as far as anybody has experimented, stuff just get keeps keeps getting smarter. So we'll be able to unlock like lots and lots of new stuff. I don't know if there's an end to it, but at least everybody in the world should be able to talk to something like really brilliant and have like incredible tools all the time. And I can't imagine that that will not like, uh, you know, not, not be able to build on uh, on itself. Um, and, and definitely, you know, like Mario, the story is just like, you know, at the core, the computation isn't that expensive. Like operations cost like 10 to the negative $18 this, these days. And, and like, <laughs> you know, if you can do this stuff efficiently, even talking to the biggest models ever trained is, you know, the, the cost of that should be like way, way lower than the value of your time or like most anybody's time. And really we should, you know, there's the, the capacity there to scale this, these things up by orders of magnitude. No, absolutely. And I'd like to end on that note. Thank you so much, Noam. It was Thank awesome you, having you.